Hey, Covenant Church, my name is Mark Artrip and I am the pastor of Movement Church in Hilliard on the west side of Columbus and it's exciting to be with you guys today. Hey, there was a time in my life that I was cool, that I was young, that I could go somewhere and people be impressed with me and like me and as you can see those days are long gone. And so when I go places to speak now, I like to just show people uh, pictures of my wife and my kids and tell them about myself. Because usually, once they see a picture of my wife, here, we'll, we'll put one up here. This is my wife, Kristen. We've been married for 16 years. And uh, here's my, my four beautiful kids. We can put up a picture of them too. The reason I like to show those pictures is most people see a picture of my wife and, and most guys are kind of like, all right, I didn't really like this guy, but I, I think I respect him now. He somehow tricked her into marrying him. And even some of the, the women see pictures of my kids and they're like, you know what? I didn't like that guy, but his kids are cute. I can't argue with that. So hopefully uh, the guys and the girls are, are respecting me a little more now, thinking I'm at least tolerable. That's, that's my family. Uh, but to explain my connection to Covenant Church a little better, um, I, love, I love your pastor, Travis. He is uh, my best friend and I've been friends with him. We've known each other since middle school uh, for like the last 25 years. And so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about that connection there. Uh, he, he went to a Christian school when we were younger. And so when we were both in middle school, he moved to our school. Uh, I was a year younger than him, and so sometimes, you know, you don't really talk when you're different grades in middle school, and uh, my, my grade and his grade kind of had a little little drama, so we weren't all friends, but we, we were just kind of the, the same person. We were like the, the only two Christians at our school. We were the redheaded guys that, that wanted to be pastors, and so we kept getting put in the same circles and the same places and, and hanging out, and so once we got into to high school, it was just kind of inevitable that we were going to be friends. We were leading Bible studies and doing different things, and we'd keep crossing paths and, and uh, we, were, we were just always hanging out. In fact, we had a, a shared love of DC Talk. I think we've, I've got a picture here to show you. There's us in like 1998 being pale and thinking we were awesome. Uh, but we, we also just loved music. And so we used to go out and pretend that we were like jars of clay and these musicians from the 90s that no one's ever heard of. We got some pictures of your pastor here. Just go ahead and scroll those beautiful pics. There's some of him posing. And we would go out and like lay in the middle of a bed of pine needles on an old car and be like, man, we're awesome. And so anyway, um, I have known Travis uh, forever and we have been great friends. Uh, both went to school to, to be pastors and, and uh, our wives are friends, our families hang out. And so we even uh, were able to be in each other's weddings. We, we both were in student ministry for a while. We both then moved to Columbus here and, and have been able to, to plant churches kind of in the same season. And so some of my first memories of Covenant Church are when he and Vanessa uh, would come down and stay at our house when I was living up in Powell and they would just be driving around Columbus and, and praying about opportunities and looking for places to plant. And I remember driving down here and saying, man, I, I'd really be looking at the uh, Grove City area, specifically what's happening in Stringtown. And so uh, I feel like, um, I've been along for the ride of Covenant Church. I've been able to, to watch what you guys have, um, have, have built here, what God has built here, and what God has developed. And so it's been cool to see you go from a theater over on Georgesville Road uh, to the building out on Alkire and to the middle school and uh, to the AMC here and now to the building that you are, are currently in. And so I just want you to know this this morning. Um, I love your pastor. I love his family. Um, I, I love your church and it's been so cool to watch behind the scenes and, and see what God has built. And uh, I want you to know um, that I've seen him uh, just pour his life and pour his heart out uh, for the gospel and specifically for God to, to build this ministry here. And I want you to know that, that you can trust him and you can trust where he uh, is going to, to lead you. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, I, I grew up with with Travis, and uh, and so I've I've known him all throughout his life. I've I uh, I could tell you stories, and, and there's I've I've shown these embarrassing pictures. I won't do any more today. But uh, the the title of this message this morning is this man myth legend, and so ironic because I've been always I've been thinking, man, I'd love to speak at Covenant sometime and be able to tell them the man, the myth, the legend that their their pastor was in high school and. Uh, there, there's, there's stories I could tell you about, uh, uh, about him getting dumped by girls and seeing him in some, some moments that were very sad in high school. There's, there's moments I could tell you about the myth. I could tell you about the high school football player he was. He was a, he was a good little player and I, I would always be sitting up in the stands. I was a soccer player and so I'd say something like, hey, this week if you get a sack, point to me and, and then flex. And so we'd have these like symbols worked out. He was, he was a very good defensive player. 
Uh, but, but more than that, more than being a man, more than being a myth, uh, there were some fun legends in, in high school. And every year we had a talent show. And uh, let's just say that your pastor used to own that talent show because uh, a lot of people where we were from were, were farmers. They were football players. They weren't smooth. They didn't play guitar, but, but your pastor, Pastor Travis, did. And so there was one year he showed up at the talent show and was like, hey, this is a song I wrote for my girlfriend, and, and people went crazy over it. And so the next year, he didn't know the talent show was coming, and he just showed up and like sang this song. I think it was like a, a song by Fernando Ortega, but, but everybody thought that he wrote it, and people were like, man, he's so good. Oh, he's, he's such a Casanova. Oh, people would be lucky to date him. Oh, we, oh he, he could get signed. He could be on a label. What they didn't know was he didn't write that song, and he didn't say he wrote that song but he didn't say that he didn't write that song. He just kind of let the, the legend build. And so when I, when I think of the man, the myth, the legend, I think of your pastor. I think of our, our high school years. But the, the message this morning is not focusing on any one human. It's not focusing on anyone because beyond all men, beyond all myths, beyond all, all legends, Jesus is, is more important, and that's what we want to focus on today. And so many great women and, and men have come before and after Jesus Christ. But we want to talk specifically from a passage this morning and show what, what separates Jesus Christ from all others. I know that you guys have been in this series. You've been walking through John chapter 1. And uh, I always think it's interesting that the last verses of the book of John kind of tell the purpose of this book. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of the book of John, that we will know who Jesus is, that we will believe and have life in him. And chapter one lays the foundation of that. I know you've talked all through the word becoming flesh, the word being Christ, the word is God. And so we want to continue that narrative today. And so if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn in John chapter one, verses 19 to 34. Let me read it along here. I'll be in the, the New International Version, the NIV, John 1, 19 to 34 says this. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Verse 23 says this, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Well, these questions are being asked by the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the religious elite leaders of that day. And Jesus and John had often and would often denounce their leadership. They would say that these men were outwardly religious, but inwardly they were filled with pride. They were filled with greed and they knew that their hearts weren't in the right place. And so the Pharisees would often try to, to come at Jesus and even John the Baptist in this instance here. They, they believed that their own oral traditions were more important or just as important as God's inspired word. And so these leaders were, were kind of sizing up John the Baptist. They were saying, all right, who is this guy? And, and they were pretending to be the, the gatekeepers of faith, but the reality is they were just threatened by what these what, what John was, was doing and, and saying. They wanted to see if he was a prophet. They wanted to see if his credentials would work out and exactly why he was catching on, why was, what he was doing was so popular. And so they wanted to know who John was, but John was just saying, listen, I'm just trying to prepare you for, for Jesus. He's going to come after me. And John was pointing people to Jesus. And so let me just take a little sidebar here and let me say this. When you are trying to point people to Jesus, if in your life you're trying to point people to Jesus, you're going to face opposition, right? That what we see here in the life of John the Baptist is, is, is the norm. And if you're pointing people to Jesus, if you're truly not pointing people to yourself, to your own ego, to your own tradition, to your own greatness, if you're saying, look, don't look at me, look at Jesus, people are going to have a problem with that. I promise you, people are going to have a problem with that. And the life of John the Baptist modeled this principle that when you're content 
and you do what God wants you to do and you let Jesus Christ be honored, God will do great things through you. But people aren't always going to like that. That's just something, a little sidebar I wanted to take there. But I think there's so many things, even in what we've read of this passage so far, that, that we can learn about who Jesus is beyond the man, the myth, the legend, beyond any human. This is what this passage can teach us about Jesus and what this interaction with John and the Pharisees here tells us. You can, you can, this, you can write this down if, if you're a note taker. First thing you can know from this passage, Jesus is Lord. And I know that sounds like a Christian bumper sticker. I know that sounds like a t-shirt shirt, but that's actually what I want you to know today, right? Jesus is Lord. Verse 23 tells us that very clearly John said it, make straight the way of the Lord. And he told us that Jesus is not just someone that makes us feel good. No, he's someone who's in a position of authority. He's someone who deserves control, someone who has power, someone who is the master, someone who is the ruler. Jesus is not just a man. He's not just something that's letting some hype build. No, Jesus is Lord. And we see that in verse 23. The second thing that we can see comes in in verse 26. And in that interaction, John said, listen, I'm not even worried to untie the straps of this guy's sandals. We already learned that Jesus is Lord, but verse 26 tells us that Jesus surpasses all men. Yes, there were men who were great teachers, who were great philosophers, who were great leaders back then. There have always been men all throughout history who were great teachers and people and philosophers and leaders and and people that others wanted to follow. But Jesus is far beyond that. Jesus is Lord and Jesus surpasses all men. Verse 29 continues on and, and says this. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. We already said that there's so many foundational things in John chapter 1. This, this passage and this interaction with John has already told us that Jesus is Lord and Jesus surpasses all men. But he's going on in this passage to let us know that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Verse 29 tells us very clearly that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now, some of you know Bible history. Some of you know the, the Ark of the Old Testament. But there were uh, this, this nation, there were these people, the Israelites, who were God's chosen people. And there was a time that they were going to be brought out of Egypt, but they had to let this, this curse, this, this plague pass over. And so Moses, their leader, instructed them to take the, the blood of a lamb and paint it over their doorposts so that, that death would pass over them and their families. And the people that didn't do that lost their firstborn. And so it took the blood of a lamb being shed in the Old Testament to save the Israelites and save their children and save their people. And the death of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection, what he accomplished on the cross, did the same thing in the New Testament. The blood of Jesus, this lamb, our lamb, takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus is the lamb of God. Verse 29 makes that clear. John is telling these people, he's telling the world, clear the path because the Lamb of God is coming and His blood takes away the sins of the world. It will have that power. It will have that ability. Verse 30, John says, again, a man who comes after me has surpassed me before... He surpassed me because he was before me. He says this, that Jesus was before all men. Jesus surpasses all men and Jesus is before all men. I'm sure that that you guys a couple weeks ago looked at John chapter 1 verse 1. Yeah, I know you talked about the fact that Jesus is pre-existent before all creation. And so Jesus is greater than every man that's ever existed. He's greater than Barack Obama. He's greater than LeBron James. He's greater than, than Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, whoever we try to praise in modern day culture. He's, he's greater than Justin Bieber. He's greater than Justin Timberlake. He's greater than the people that we attach a claim to because Jesus was before all men and Jesus was pre-existent before creation. Here's another thing that we can learn in verse 32. Jesus is one-third of our triune God. 
we see this interaction at the baptism of Jesus and John is telling this story. There's another place that this story is told in Matthew chapter 3. But at the baptism of Jesus, we, we get to see the Trinity together. We see Jesus, the Son, being baptized. We see God the Father speaking down to him from heaven. And we see the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. And so in this moment, we get a glimpse into the Trinity. And the Trinity is so difficult to explain. And it's so difficult for our human minds to fathom. And yet it's so necessary to understand the otherness of Jesus, the otherness of God, the greatness of God, and exactly who God is. God is three persons. God is three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And just as we kind of already tipped our hat to John chapter 1, verse 1, we know that Jesus is coexistent with the Father. There's, there's, there's different moments we see the Father, we see the Son, we see the Holy Spirit. We're given different glimpses of God and His character in those three persons. And they're, they're, they're different and yet they're one and the same. And that's the picture of God that we're given. That's who our Jesus is. That's who John was able to see even in that earthly moment at the baptism of Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but but God the Father didn't speak out of heaven at my baptism. And that's not to speak down to my baptism or to mock it, but just to say that Jesus is on another level and Jesus is one third of our triune God. Verse 33 goes on to tell us that Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. John tells us very clearly here that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit, not just with water. Water would be symbolic, but there would be something that was so much greater, so much other. And so Jesus has given us the one who seals our hearts, who walks with us, who illuminates our thoughts, who is with us all the time. And Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit and has given us the Holy Spirit. Verse 34 goes on to say, I think, what might be the greatest part of this passage. Verse 34 says this, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Jesus was not just a man. Jesus was not just a prophet. Jesus was not just a great teacher. But as all of these things have been building up and telling us, Jesus was God's chosen one. Jesus is the one who God wanted to come to this earth to give his life, to change our lives to pay the price for our sin, to to restore the relationship that we had lost with, with God. And so the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus became that bridge that, that filled the gap between us and between God. Jesus is God's chosen one. Verse 34 tells us that really well. And so if you've been taking notes, we've said that Jesus is a lot of things. This passage has given us a glimpse into Jesus being a lot of things. Jesus is Lord. Jesus surpasses all men. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus was before all men. Jesus is one third of the Trinity. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is God's chosen one. So why does any of this matter for us? Why does this matter as we read this passage? What can we learn from the life and the ministry of John the Baptist? Well, John knew one thing and he he modeled it so well. He knew that Jesus mattered, that Jesus changed everything, that Jesus was all that people needed to know and he did everything he could to point people to that Jesus. As we interact, as we live our lives, as we go to school, as we parent our kids, as we go to our job, as we play sports, as we interact with neighbors, as we interact with family, we have one job and one job only. We'll do many other things and those things are good, but our time here on earth should be to point people to Jesus, to put their attention and their eyes and their focus on Jesus. We should point people to Jesus because as you know, Jesus came to this world. He was part of the the incarnation where he, he took on flesh and he came into this world and Jesus embodied flesh. He embodied all that God is and all that we needed in those moments. And rather than pointing people to Jesus, rather than living to to represent Jesus, we, we practice this, this new concept that someone was telling me about this week. It's it's the opposite of incarnation. It's, it's, it's excarnation, the opposite of, of incarnation, of, of being flesh, of being Jesus in, in the moments, in the lives we live. Sometimes we do everything we can to take Jesus out of moments, 
The Pharisees that John the Baptist was talking to loved to point people to themselves and to their own rules. And sometimes you and I point people away from Jesus or we, re- we reduce following Jesus to simply this, just showing up one hour a week and dropping $10 in the offering plate and feeling good about ourselves, but we don't actually go into moments living for Jesus. We don't actually go into moments and, 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 and live to be the hands and feet of Jesus and take on the ministry of Jesus. Rather than being incarnation, we're being excarnation. We're removing Jesus from the lives and the platforms and the opportunities that we've been given. This passage is telling us all of these attributes of Jesus, all of these things that John the Baptist pointed out, all of these ways that he said that this is who Jesus is, this is how Jesus is other, this is how Jesus is different, and this is how Jesus is more. And yet sometimes through our words, through our actions, we don't live that out. We are to live out the incarnation and to mirror the life of Jesus. We are to bring Jesus into the neighborhood. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus and and to bring Jesus into the spaces that we are, to point people to Jesus. That's our homework as we know this, that Jesus is Lord. Jesus surpasses all men. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus was before all men. Jesus is one-third of the Trinity. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is God's chosen one. Our job is to tell the world about that Jesus with our life, with our speech, and with our actions. Hey, I, uh, I got a chance to, uh, to go to L.A. many years ago with my wife. It was uh, just before our oldest son was going to be born, and we kind of saw this as our baby moon. And so we decided that we had been to L.A., we'd been to California for a conference or something, but we'd never really just been there to, to hang out and, and take it all in. We'd never really got a chance to, to see everything. We'd never really had a chance to just chase down some of this fun stuff. And, and so we planned to be out there for a week and stay with some friends. We got really cheap plane tickets and we were able to go to the CBS studios. My wife is obsessed with America's Funniest Videos, AFV. And so we went to a taping of that long ago. Don't judge me, don't judge me. We went to that. We were able to go to The Tonight Show back when Jay Leno hosted. We were able to get some tickets and go to some other shows and, and do some fun things and go to the beaches. and. One thing that we got to do, we got to go to a press conference where they were announcing the Grammy Awards and see a lot of people, Rascal Flatts and Justin Timberlake and and all these people. And we also found out that back then there was a website that would tell you all of the movie premieres that were happening that week. And, you know, in Ohio, to us, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But a, but a movie premiere, it, it's, it, it's a fun thing out there, right? And, and so uh, we, we found this website, and this was actually when uh, Will Smith had a movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, that was coming out. And so uh, in that, in that, uh, that movie, there, it, was a, it was a big thing at that time, and the premiere was going to be a big deal. And so we got on this website, we found out when this premiere was happening, and we went to this theater, and they'd, they had set up the, the, the walls and the red carpet and all this stuff, and we got like this front row seat. And, and all these people came through. I, I'll never forget it. I remember like Tom Cruise came through and uh, J-Lo and, and eventually Will Smith got out of this car and there's crowds and people are yelling and we were right by the door and Will Smith walked by us and I was like, Will, 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 what's up, man? And he came over and he's like, hey guys. And he's like, pat me on the shoulder. And I was like, man, can I get a picture? And this was, this was pre-iPhone days. This wasn't like with the reverse built-in camera. And so I didn't know what to do, but I had my digital camera there and uh, my, my wife was there and I just said, can I get a picture quick? And I, I turned and went to take that picture and I was like this and Will had his arm around me and he's like, hey, isn't that so nice to meet you guys. And he literally walked into theater. We were the last people that he talked to. And when I went to hit the preview on my camera, I went to look at that picture. I didn't know this, but I'd been taking pictures of of people all night and my camera had been zoomed in. And so I I met Will Smith and this is like 2006. This is like the height of his popularity. I mean, this is when he had not just been a rapper, when he had not just been the Fresh Prince, when he'd not just been Mr. Fourth of July and all these hundred million dollar movies, but he had built this career and he'd taken on serious acting and he'd been nominated for like an Oscar. this was at the height. He was, he was Will Smith. He could have run for president probably and, and won it. And so I'm like, man, there's probably no one I'd rather have a picture with. This is going to be so cool when I drop it on Facebook. And, and I had taken that picture and I hit the preview button and I went to look at it and my camera had been zoomed in. And so Will went like this for the picture and my camera was zoomed in. And I, I took a picture of, of the, the, the webbing, this, this meaty spot between the thumb and the finger. I just had this square right here 
of Will Smith's hand. No one would ever know that I, that I met him. No one would ever know that I saw him. No one would ever know who he was. And they just, they just saw this. And the reason that that let me down is because I'm thinking like, man, this is a big deal. This was a game changer. This is going to be so cool. I was going to get to tell people about this. I was going to get to drop that online and everybody was going to see it. And instead, my friends, my friends were going to see this right here. I'd be like, no, 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 that's, that's Will Smith's hand. I promise, I promise, that's, that's Will Smith's hand. And people would probably be like, no, nah, I bet it is. Yeah, sure, that's, that's your hand, tough guy. That's, that's not Will Smith. Well, here's how I think that relates to our passage as I close up here today. You and I have an opportunity to know God. We have an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus. We have an opportunity to have a relationship with the Savior of the world. And we have an opportunity to see Jesus and know hope and share Jesus in a way that, that many people do not. We've talked about all these ways that, that we know who Jesus is. That Jesus is Lord. That Jesus surpasses all men. That Jesus is the Lamb of God. That Jesus was before all men. That Jesus is one third of our triune God. That Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit and that Jesus is God's chosen one. But do the people who look at your life, who interact with you, who live with you see that? Do you let them see everything that God is? Everything that Jesus is in your life? Everything that Jesus can be in their life? Or do you just let them see this little section? Do you just let them see that, hey, sometimes when it's convenient, you go to church? Hey, sometimes when it's convenient, maybe you throw a little money God's way if it's not hurting your style too much that month. Or do they look at your life and do they see this guy is sold out for Jesus? This guy's emotions are given to Jesus. This person's platform is given to Jesus. They're parenting in the name of Jesus. They're living with the impact of Jesus in mind. They, they own their home and manage their home and entertain in their home with Jesus in mind. Are we letting people see everything that Jesus is, everything that Jesus can be, or are we just giving them a little glimpse? If you have never understood who Jesus is, we talked about a lot today, but I want you to know this, that you were created in the image of God to know God. But in some way, all of us as, as humans, we, we think that we know better than God and we try to do things our own way and that's called sin. And when sin enters our lives, enters this world and enters our hearts, it separates us from God. But God didn't want us to be separated from him. And so he sent his one and only son, Jesus, the, the very person that John the Baptist was talking about, that was saying, hey, there's a guy coming after me that's great. It's going to blow your minds. Jesus came and, and lived a, a life on this earth. And when he was accused of wrongdoing, he didn't, he didn't deserve the punishment, but he took that punishment to pay the price for our sins, our sins that separate us from God. And the finished work of Jesus on the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus paid the price for our sins and builds a bridge to overcome our sin and close that gap and that distance between us and God. And by putting our faith and our hope and our trust in, in Jesus, we can know God and we can have relationship with God and be in perfect relationship with God just as we were created to. All we have to do is know that you and I are not enough, but Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus, the life of Jesus is enough. And we're saved by faith, through faith in Jesus Christ. When we put our trust in Jesus, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, when we say, Jesus, I'm not enough, but you are. And because you're enough, I want to live my life to honor you. I want to live my life to glorify you. I want to live my life in response to you. When we put our trust in him, he comes into our lives and he transforms us and he changes us and he saves us. And so I want to ask you this morning, do you know who Jesus is? Do you have a clear picture of who Jesus is? Do you understand what it means to honor him, to live for him, to represent him in the circles that you run in with the platform that you have? Do you understand all of these bullet points, all of these snapshots, all of these ways that we're told who Jesus is, and are you representing that to the world? Are you giving people a full picture of Jesus, or are you giving them a small picture of Jesus by the way that you live? Our lives and our speech and our parenting and our work ethic and everything that we are and everything that we want to be should tell the world that Jesus is Lord. Jesus surpasses all men. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus was before all men. Jesus is one third of the Trinity. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit and Jesus is God's chosen one. 
My prayer this week is that our lives will tell that story, that our mouths will tell that story, that when people look at how we live, they will know who Jesus is. They will know a full picture of Jesus, and they will see that in the people that we are. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for a chance to look at this passage. I thank you so much for the the way that we are told who Jesus is and that we can understand that because of your word. God, I pray if there's anyone watching that has not seen a, a clear picture of who Jesus is, has not understood the greatness of who Jesus is, or has not understood that he gave his life or the sacrifice that he paid, Lord, I pray that today will be the day that someone will put their faith into Jesus, that they will rely on Jesus, that they will surrender their life to Jesus and follow him. I pray that, that their life going forward, that our lives going forward will tell that story. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the chance to worship together. We thank you for the chance to be in your word. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.